back to another episode of Questions with Crocker with me, Dr. Crocker, and my husband, Shane. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. We just dropped the kids off at school, and we need to get a podcast done because I am headed out of town tonight. You are? <laughs> I put things on the calendar, and then you pretend like you didn't know about I haven't them. I made it past 11 o'clock on my calendar yet. Oh, okay. Well, we are both still waking up. I'm finishing my coffee right now. The animals are trying to get settled, so it's... uh. It's a morning for sure. So anyways, we are excited to be back podcasting. We missed last week because life had just been crazy. I have been traveling. Uh, We had the solar eclipse and we are in the zone of totality. Um, And I will say that you initially were very much like, what's the big deal? Why is everyone making a big deal out of the eclipse? However, you ended up thinking it was pretty cool. It was very cool. I don't know that I would have lost sleep over it, but... (laughs) It was very cool, yeah. <laughs> well, I so we were at volleyball, and we made it back in time, and we actually uh, grabbed Corbin out of school, and then we all went to my mom's house. And my mom kept saying, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience to have with my grandkids. And it was actually very cool. The kids were amazed how dark it got. We all had our glasses. Um, we were just laughing and having a good time. And it felt like a very like powerful experience, like to know that it could get that dark that quickly and then just all of a sudden brighten back up. It was it was cool. And I had made a video on social media about the eclipse. And no, I did not say that your dogs might go blind. That was like one of the top Google searches. Will my dog go blind during the eclipse? Because animals are not going to just like stare up at the sky at something until they go blind. People will do that, but animals will not. However, I made a video saying that If your pet has storm anxiety, they might get scared all of a sudden because it gets really dark, which happens before storms, or they might be confused about like, oh, is it time to eat because it got dark? And I actually had text messages from friends saying, oh my gosh, as soon as it got dark, my dog like rushed over to the food bowl and wanted to eat. Uh, And then on the radio, one of the radio hosts the next morning was saying that their storm anxiety dog like started crying and ran upstairs and hid under the bed. So even though people think sometimes it is... Uh, silly the things we say and recommend and no it does not apply to every dog we definitely had those circumstances but fortunately it was quick it was cool and i'm glad we got to experience it i would agree would you do it again probably yeah (laughs) you just wouldn't like go to another state no camp out no we saw some people in this area that had full-on telescopes were camping out from the morning on to get like the best view and we both agreed that we're probably not those people no it was very (laughs) cool but that was about the extent of what I would do. Of, of the extremes we would go to for the <clears throat> eclipse. So, yes. But I'm glad we got to experience it and with our kids, which was very, very cool. So uh, speaking of travel, I am going to the University of Illinois today, and I'm excited because I'm going to a VB May meeting uh, that's also hosted with VEG. And so VB May is the Veterinary Business Management Association, and it is basically vet school's attempt uh, to have an organization that helps with actual business side of veterinary medicine because we both know that it's not something that's addressed that much in school. And so I'm going to go talk about leadership, uh, especially related to veterinary medicine, which sometimes I don't know if I'm qualified to talk about that, but I guess I've been doing this long enough that I can at least share my good and bad experiences as a leader and with other leaders. What is your perception like coming from the human side of things on veterinarians and their business sense. Is this coming from Dr. Levine's standpoint (laughs) or my standpoint? No, we can get into him uh, later, but I want to know in general, because you've been to conferences, you've talked to a lot of people uh, that own practices or want to, you've been to talks. What is your takeaway on how we're doing educating about business, handling business in veterinary medicine? I think there could be a lot more education done on the business side of things, especially for those that are eventually going to go down the path of owning their own hospital, they probably need a little bit more help in that area. Do you think just because you have a finance background, these things just come to you? Or do you feel like you had to, after school, do a lot more training and learning when it came to running a business and being a leader and all these other things? I think just as veterinarians are passionate about learning about medicine and learning how to treat animals, it comes natural. That'd be the same for me with business. Like I just learn through observation and reading because it's what I enjoy doing. Yeah. 
I'm not sure that all veterinarians have that same passion for business as they do for medicine. I would agree with you. And I would say probably the veterinarians that are like the most successful that have big multiple practice situations or uh, grow their own practice into a, you know, large operation are the ones that are more passionate about business and have really spent a lot of time either starting out as students in BBMA because there's a lot of great resources through that organization if you want to take advantage of it in vet school, but it does take extra time to be a part of it. Um, But then they are always growing and learning and being a part of even uh, like mastermind groups and things like that to, to increase their skills. I feel like I'm in the middle area on business. I really like it in the sense that my logical science side of my brain likes to be able to actually look at the numbers. And you've taught me, like, let's actually look at the numbers. Let's see how the practice is doing. Okay, we feel like we want to hire somebody else. Let's actually look at what that looks like financially and what our, you know, book of business looks like and how many people are rebooking with us and, you know, how much have we grown. So I like being able to take the data and then apply it to decisions. I don't necessarily like to dial down so much that, you know, I know inventory costs on every little thing um, and want to make those small adjustments that are going to save like a couple bucks a month. Um, But I think it's good to have both ends of the spectrum and also people that are really good at certain things. So you are definitely the business brain of this operation. But I've tried my best to learn. But I also think if you have the right team in place, that goes a long way as well. I mean, you if you have, have a, a great CPA that also does your, you know, bookkeeping mm-hmm. on a weekly, monthly basis, you don't have to really know that much about business. You have to be able to listen to the advice they give and execute on it. But that's probably a big part of it is actually listening to the yes. advice that they give. Because I will say that I have been a part of practices where they've been told certain things and then maybe they take those things to the extreme um, and it doesn't go well or putting those things into practice. They're too slow to do it and it's frustrating for the team. So I do think there is a component of getting the information, but then acting on the information, which is probably one of the most important parts of being a leader. I agree with you having the right people around, but your CPA is not going to be the one that's going to ultimately make that decision on hiring another person or changing your fees, you're the one that has to do those things. Correct. And I'm a decision maker. I'm a fast decision maker. Sometimes maybe I make decisions too fast and do things and then I have to say, oh, that doesn't necessarily work. Let's reassess what that looks like. But I definitely don't have a problem seeing a trend or seeing something that we need to change and saying, yep, let's change it. I'm not scared of change. I would agree. Which is good and bad in so many circumstances. So, um, But overall, I'm excited to go and talk to VBMA, talk about leadership, and we're also going to do a cases night, which, you know, I love sharing cases. So speaking of cases, uh, we had a good one. Oh, that's your alarm. That's my alarm. What was that for? I'm not sure. Okay, good, good. Glad it, glad it was important. But we did have a case uh, come into our general practice, and um, it was a case that I was up there and I was doing some admin work, and they said, you know, come look at this x-ray. The dog had been in the day before and had been vomiting uh, for several days, and they took an x-ray, and they were concerned because the stomach did look kind of large, and the stomach you know, empties into what's called the pylorus and the intestines. And so it gets real narrow. So a lot of times if you have like a foreign body in there, it'll get stuck right there at the narrow part and then the stomach will get really big. So that's why you'll have pets constantly vomiting because their stomach can't empty. So they had been seen the day before, hadn't taken x-rays. The owners wanted to kind of treat symptomatically, see if it improved. So they gave some fluids and they gave an injection of anti-nausea medication, Serenia. With Serenia on board, your pet really should not throw up for 24 hours. So sent it home and they called that morning and said, eh, he vomited last night like two, three times. So definitely wanted him to come back in. Came back in. Dog just looked really puny, didn't look great. So owners agreed to take x-rays at that time. And you could see the stomach was really large and then it looked like there was something stuck right past the stomach. And so um, had a discussion uh, about what needed to be done. It was kind of mid-morning, which usually we're finishing up a surgery at that time, but I was up there and uh, the other doctor asked me, hey, would you be willing to cut this dog and do surgery on it? I really think it needs it. And they really can't afford financially to go to a 24-hour facility at this point in time. 
So I love doing surgery. <laughs> and I was like, of course I'll do it. So I did it and it was great. Uh, it was a single enterotomy, which means a single cut into the intestines. I removed what kind of looked like a rubbery, round, oval shaped, like nut looking thing, but it was more rubber and they have no clue what it was. And it was just wedged right there, removed it. The dog stayed with us for, I think, a day and a half in the hospital, was doing really well, well hydrated and sent home. And then they just left this really great Google review with like pictures of the dog playing outside and saying the dog was doing great and they really appreciated us and um, that we saved their dog's life, which we did. And it was great because it's really why I like working emergency at a 24-hour facility, but also having a hospital that we can help out when we're able to, and we're able to help people, especially with financial constraints. Um, and so having kind of both a foot in both worlds um, is good for me to kind of remember both sides of the spectrum, I guess. I would agree. So it was fun. And I like having good Google reviews. <laughs> so it's always, always a plus. plus. Yeah. If you love your veterinarian, uh, go online and leave them a great Google review and it will make their day um, because we love hearing those stories and getting that feedback. And the team does, too. It's really, really important to us uh, in this industry. So that's my PSA for pet parents right now. So speaking of finances and people, we're just going to hit on this really quick because I feel like a lot of time has been spent on it on social media. But let's talk about Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine is a human cardiologist in the New York area, and uh, he, over the past couple of days, decided and was inspired after his cat went to the veterinarian to kind of go on a social media rant about veterinarians and called us uh, a scam uh, in the way that we charge sometimes, uh, stated that we were the reason that pets can be adopted because vet care is unaffordable. Uh, made a lot of claims about how we do things in business that really weren't accurate, and also comparing us to kind of the way he does things, which human healthcare and you know vet healthcare is very different. But you actually watched a lot of the videos, so what was your kind of perception of him and what was going on with everything? I can't figure out his motive for releasing these videos. I don't know if he was upset at the bill that he got from his veterinarian or what ultimately triggered, you know, his his rants. One of his big rant was on markup of lab fees. Mm -hmm. And he referenced the Stark Law, which I have a history in human medicine, so I understand this stuff pretty well. Um, Stark Law is really in place so that uh, doctors can't financially benefit off of self-referrals, meaning if you're a physician and you own an x-ray facility, sending people to get x-rays done, um, even though they don't need them so that you benefit financially. <clears throat> Almost saying that veterinarians have a stake financially in the labs, therefore they're going to send more pets to have labs done that don't need to be done. Right. That's kind of what he's referencing. Um, which I don't believe is really the case. Um, he also um, made a claim that the um, vet should not be able to upcharge the lab fees. Yeah, he really liked to, to throw out the word upcharge, which I think has a really negative connotation. And even though <clears throat> even in his half ass apology video, he said upcharge like 10 times. And again, it's not a it's not an upcharge um, directly with the cost of the lab. What he's not accounting for is that in human medicine, you have an infrastructure of lab facilities that are everywhere. So you go to your doctor, they refer you to go get lab work done. You leave the ho- the doctor's office, you go schedule appointment, you go get lab drawn, and then you go back typically to pay your doctor to interpret that and to have the next steps done. In vet med, A, you don't have the infrastructure in place to do that. Um, the amount of technicians needed to draw blood is significantly more than that of a human. Uh, the inconvenience of having somebody leave your office to go make another appointment to drag your pet there to have that done, the, the, it just logically doesn't make sense. So what veterinarians are charging for in that lab fee is the lab draw, the time it takes to do that with the people, the interpretation of the doctor's knowledge to prescribe next steps. So it's not an upcharge specifically to that lab fee. It's an overall service it's a bundle. around the lab work. Right Now, what he's not accounting for is that, let's say that, just use round numbers, if that lab charges $100 for a certain test 
if they had infrastructure set up in place where you had to leave to go to another facility and they had buildings and people and things already set up, that lab wouldn't be $100 anymore. That lab cost would now be $150 because that lab itself has to cover the cost of the infrastructure to do that. There's no different than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We are the lab. Right. Right. So we're not upcharging that lab cost. This is the cost associated with the whole bundle of the process. Well, and even if we are adding to the flat cost of something, whatever it is in your hospital, right, you have to add to the cost of something that it is costing me as an owner to pay the technicians to do the work, to pay the doctor to do the interpretation, because we have to be able to pay for the that, building. That, that's and what I'm saying. Things. So, so if, if you looked at the cost, let's use LabCorp as an example from human medicine. They are a business that financially makes a ton of money. If you look at their finances associated with their facility, they've got costs just like we have, and they drop money down to the bottom line as a profit just like we do. I guarantee at the end of the day, their profit margins in those lab facilities is significantly higher than we're charging for our lab work inside of the four walls of our hospital. Well, it's interesting because most veterinary hospitals that are successful that I know of run about a 20 percent profit maybe as an owner. Um, and you've already said like the profit margins are really low compared to most businesses you've been a part of. And so he was basically saying if you own a business in veterinary medicine, you shouldn't make money. You should you should do what you need to do for the pets and not make money because having any sort of profit doesn't make sense. And you are the reason that people and, and can't take care of their animals. And again, this is my biggest cons- my biggest problem with this whole rant that he went on. <clears throat> he talks the same about human medicine. Yes. Human medicine is a complete uh, broken system. Yes. But yet he wants veterinary medicine to replicate some of that of human medicine. Right. The last thing that veterinarians want to do and the last thing that people want their veterinarians to do is try to replicate what's been done in human medicine. The inefficiency, the cost associated with it, the insurance, it doesn't make sense. Well, and, and, and for him to say, here's here's a solution. And you look at those solutions that he's proposing and how that's just killed human medicine makes no sense at all. And then you look at him as an individual saying human medicine costs are too high, yet his practice hadn't made any kind of changes to associate with that. I mean, Dr. Molly went and made phone calls to his practice to ask specifically about certain tests Mm -hmm. and the charges associated with those. He's part of the problem. Well, but the thing is, and I said this in my reply video, he should charge people to interpret those tests. Absolutely. He went to school a really long time. He has a lot of great knowledge. He is helping people. I should charge people to interpret a test for a pet because guess what? Even if that test gets run, somebody has to look at it and say, this value matters. This doesn't. This pet is healthy and is good. This pet needs more follow up. And so. So the difference would be if that test costs us $100, he wants to see on his bill, the uh test is $100. The interpretation fee, $25. The blood draw for two technicians, $25. Itemize the heck out of it so that now a, a a customer looks at it and says, what are all these charges? Mm-hmm. We just bundle that together. Right. Well, that's how human medicine does it because they code everything, right? right? So they have everything itemized out. But it, it the thing is, and he got a lot of feedback that what he was saying was not accurate. Um, and he really didn't like that. Like I made one comment on his video asking if he inter- charged for interpretations. And I also said I'd be happy to compare invoices of what he charged versus what we charged. And he blocked me right away. So it's interesting when people like put things out there on social media and then shut everything down comments wise and block anybody who's not agreeing with them. So I appreciate everyone on social media in the veterinary community who now is starting to say when these people put out this type of misinformation that hurts our industry so much. I mean, some of the comments from pet owners were astounding and so hateful towards veterinarians as a whole. And so it's nice that we now have a group of people who can say, hey, guess what? This is not the way it is. And guess what? We are doing our best for you. And this is hurtful and this is not helpful and this is not doing anything for pet owners, you saying these things. And so that was kind of my biggest takeaway. Like there's always going to be somebody ranting on social media about the cost of veterinary medicine. But the fact that we are on there also and we can see these things quickly, we were all getting tagged in it because people were like, hey, this guy's putting out this information that's just not okay. And then being able to respond in a way that actually 
made a, an impact and benefited us, I think is one of the best parts of doing social media stuff. Yeah, again, I, I go back to I still can't understand the the motive for what he's doing. Well, he did in one video. He said he had a recent uh, death exper- life death experience, and that motivated him to speak out about things that he didn't think were were fair and just. And, and I'm okay with that. Which, but but here, yeah, here right. here's the deal. Have open dialogue right. with somebody in the industry right. before you put out a lot of misinformation. Again, if you go back to the core of business, if you took the the model and said, we want locations everywhere, and we staff those locations, and we have gas turned on and lights turned on and water turned on and all the other expenses associated with it, that $100 lab is not $100 anymore. Right. It's $150, which is what the veterinarians are charging for that same infrastructure. Right. So have open dialogue before you go out put out misinformation. Well, and obviously people put out information when they are emotional and fired up on social media. And he did get a lot of feedback that I think has slowed down some of his ranting. But ultimately, he was telling people, I'm going to make videos about how to contact Congress. We need to change this. We need to, like, get rid of this scam. Uh, veterinarians are upcharging. Like, he was using really strong language and and also encouraging people to kind of go after veterinarians. And that is where it becomes dangerous because you don't know if that person who recently got a bad diagnosis on their pet and they are already – very emotional and angry that could be yeah something that would ignite them to maybe do something more serious to a veterinarian or to a vet's office and so we really have to be careful what language we use even when we are venting about something on social media and i had to take like a day and a half before i even made a video in response to him because i was so frustrated about it and fired up and i didn't want to say anything disrespectful to him in return so i think that it is a fine balance. But the great thing is we do have a group of people now that have a large enough platform and voice that we can actually say something and we can, I think, make a difference in the long run. So thank you to everyone who was out there, who shared, who liked, who did everything, um, because I do think it made a a huge difference for our industry as a whole. And the moral of the story is veterinary medicine should not mimic that of human health care. Yes. In any Form, shape, fashion, whatsoever. You and I could tell plenty of stories yes. from human health care that would, that would make that example. So, okay, so let's get into our question of the day. This podcast is based off of people sending us questions uh, to me as a veterinarian, to you as an entrepreneur, to us as practice owners. We are not experts uh, in anything. We just share our experiences. And I kind of got uh, two questions that were similar, and so I wanted to address it kind of as one. So Erica... I think it was Hester, uh, said, I just had my first anatomy lab. So she's a vet student. Congratulations. And I felt behind because people were discussing uh, terms that I had not heard before. I know I shouldn't compare myself, but sometimes I just can't help it. And then Jasmine Oropaza said, um, how do you handle comparing yourself to your peers and how do you change that mindset? So it was very similar thread. And I think that it's something important to talk about because no matter where you are in your career, who you are, there's going to be moments where you have a comparison that happens and you feel like less than. So first off, I wanted to ask you if you've ever had moments like that or you've ever experienced that in your lifetime. Yeah, I mean, growing up playing sports, I think you learn pretty early on that sometimes you compare yourself to your peers. Maybe they throw harder, run faster, hit harder, whatever that might be. Um, but also think through sports, I learned to adapt and become very self-confident in my abilities and do things, uh, my way and lean towards my strengths. So I probably learned a lot of that early on in sports that kind of carry through, you know, through my career. Obviously you're going to see people that advance faster. Mm -hmm. Um, like naturally. Yeah. Maybe they have, you know, a bigger personality and there's always those guys that walk in a room and the room kind of lights up because it's just their personality and who they are. So I think sometimes you sit back and compare yourself to those type of guys. Um, But at the same token, if you build self-confidence, you learn what your strengths are and lean into those strengths. I'm not going to walk into a room and change the dynamic in that room, but I can have a one-on-one with the most important person in that room and probably at the end of the day get the same impact that this guy had, right? So I just learned to kind of change my approach approach and lean into my strengths. But a lot of it just comes with being self-confident in your own abilities. I don't think, though, that you ever 
stop comparing yourself completely to no, people. No, I would agree. I would say that having the mindset of like, how do I just stop that? And is, sometimes that's okay, right? Right. I mean, sometimes that's, that's say. the the motivation that drives you to do better and be better is to say, man, that guy's, that person's, you know, hitting home runs right now. I need to go do the same. Yeah. So, I mean, I think as practice owners, there's people that I really admire the way that they've run their practices and built them. And I am, you know, comparing to them in where I'm at and where we want to be with the practice and trying to, instead of saying, man, I wish I was there or man, I wish I had done this, this or this already trying to say, you know, how did they get there? What can I learn from them? What am I good at that's going to allow me to do that? Where do I need help and need people to like help me achieve that um, has been my experience, I guess, with as a practice owner. I will say I'm probably similar to you in I have probably an uncommon amount of self-confidence. And I think a lot of that I developed because I like showed and competed on horses at a national level from really young age. So I too experienced like there was always people with horses better than me. There was always people that naturally just were taller, skinnier, looked better on a horse. And, you know, I constantly was comparing myself to them. And then what was I really good at? How could I shine and stand apart? And I had a lot of successes. And I also had, you know, some people that I felt like they always beat me, um, no matter how hard I tried. And so I had to learn at a young age to lean into the things I was really good at and recognize those things and also realize there is a component of, you know, natural ability or things that some people are going to have that you just will never have. I think in these circumstances, it sounds like she has friends that were probably working in vet hospitals or doing something where they had exposure to anatomy and to terms or they took an extra class. And so really, there's not a way that she can go back and have that experience also. But I'm sure there's things that she is really good at that they struggle with also. So I personally, and this might be just a tip for vet students, is I found in vet school specifically that me and my friends kind of decided that we would study together as groups and we would be encouraging to each other. But we didn't really talk about tests, test scores, test answers afterwards because there really wasn't any value in it. Because let's say we put two different answers and we didn't know yet who was right and who was wrong. Um And all it did was mess with your head. Or let's say that I was really happy that I got an 82 because it was really hard test to me. And someone's like, oh, man, all I got was, you know, a 94. And you're like, oh, okay, well, (laughs) now I feel dumb. And so for me, it was better not to talk about grades and test answers. And we kind of decided as a friend group that that made more sense for us. And obviously, if someone was struggling or wanted to share, then we would, you know, let them. But there was some people that right after the test, they'd all get together and talk about every single answer and every single thing. And you could just see people be deflated. It's just an emotional drain. Yeah. And they hadn't even gotten their scores yet. So I think that there are a couple of things you can do intentionally to kind of help yourself out. Obviously, social media doesn't help um, because I say this all the time, like you might see me doing a lot of things on social media or doing really cool surgeries, but that doesn't mean that it didn't take me a long time to get to where I am and learn. Or that every day is that. That's right. Or that, you know, there's not really hard days. And and I try to share both sides of it, Um, but I never want anyone to look at me and say, like, man, I hope that I can eventually do that or. I'm at the same point in my career. I wish I was doing that. I think that they're, all that's going to do is make you feel defeated and you're going to lose sight of the things you have accomplished. Yeah. Anyone that got into vet school yeah, has accomplished yeah. something. That's exactly right. Anyone who graduates vet they're school. They're moving in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, the the it, just to get to that point, you are an elite person in this industry. Yeah. So I've got two points to make. One would be, just like we talked about, um, Everybody's going to compare themselves to somebody at some point. Right. Use that as motivation, not as um, uh, some people might, you know, shut down or or want to take a step back. Use that comparison as motivation. But then, too, remember, there's probably somebody looking at you Mm -hmm. and comparing themselves to you as well. So just remember that in the back of your head that, hey, somebody's probably trying to get to where I'm at, mm-hmm. right? So use those in front of you as motivation and remember there's others behind you that are probably trying to catch you as well. And if there's specific things that are constantly making you feel like you're less than, then you need to stop those things. So if scrolling on social media actually makes you feel like, man, all these other vet students are doing all these things and I'm not, 
then don't scroll on social media. Or if you do, yeah. don't follow vet students that make you feel that way. If you, you know, are in class and somebody is spouting off all the answers and it's really messing with you, I think it's reasonable to say, hey, you know what? I'm still learning these things. Um, can you kind of keep the answers to yourself and let me just kind of take it in and we can talk about it later? I think it's good to to see what are those triggers that are happening for me that are making me feel this way? And then how can I adapt uh, my environment to help me? And you're not going to be able to change everything, right? So some of it is training your own mind to see things in a different way, see yourself in a different way. And then some of it is if there's something very obvious, a, a habit that you're doing that's making you feel that way, stopping that habit. Um, I have definitely had times, especially on social media, where I felt like, man, my account's not growing and this person's taken off. And, you know, even starting to think like ugly thoughts like, oh, they're taking off because they're prettier than me or because they dress this way. And, you know, I'm putting out good information. Why? And I have to actually take like a break from social media at that point because that's not yep. where I want my mind to be all the time. The other thing was with speaking. When I got into speaking at conferences, major imposter syndrome major feeling like I really probably didn't belong there and comparing myself to people who had been doing this for 10, 15 years and were getting paid an amount of money that I never could have imagined and, you know, honestly kind of iced me out a little bit. And so just feeling very bad about myself, but then refocusing. I remember I sent you a picture from my first talk and I was like, people actually came to hear me. And now I still send you pictures or tell you about it. And it's like, okay, I'm finally having people want to hear what I have to say and like supporting me. But whether it's five people or it's, you know, 500 people, there's still something of value that you're sharing. And so I think that there's no 100% way that each I can tell every person to like handle it and deal with it. But there are books out there, there's resources, there's things you can look up, but definitely trying to retrain your mind and set your environment up to make you more successful it's also okay to get help and ask mm, some yeah. people to help maybe you're not self-aware of the, the triggers right mm -hmm. but talking to somebody and maybe having them point out like hey you know you've mentioned this three or four times let's avoid this going forward yeah that's so. really great or having somebody look at you and say guess what you are really good at a b and c because we have a hard time sometimes recognizing what the things are that make us who we are and that other people might look at us and say man i wish i could do that i wish i you know acted like that i wish people respected me like that and those might be things that you don't even see in yourself so asking a good friend like i'm really struggling right now you know is there anything that you see that i do that you're like man that's really amazing and that's really great and i would like if you were really having a hard time, I would actually write those things down and I would remind yourself because everyone is exceptional and everyone has something about themselves. Yeah, and go back to your, you're in vet school, so you're yeah. you're doing a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, sometimes just looking back and saying, okay, there's 130 people in this class. There was probably 500 trying to get in. Oh, right? there's more than that. There's absolutely going to be somebody in this class smarter than me. I'm not going to be the smartest person in this room, nor do I probably want to be, but there's a lot of other people that didn't get to where I'm at. Yeah. So even though I may not know all that anatomy language, there's somebody that knows a lot less than I do. Yeah. So. No, I think that's really valuable. And I think that ultimately it is a process and you will have moments in your career where you feel like you are doing a great job and you are really a rock star. And you will have moments where you look at everyone else and say, I don't even know how they let me become a veterinarian. <laughs> And so that's normal. That's normal. And it's something that you will deal with. So just know that, recognize that, but be able to push through that and get to the other side because it's definitely worth it in the long run. I would agree. Anything else? No. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully you don't feel alone in these feelings because I guarantee you everyone else in the world feels the same way and everyone else in your vet school class do, does too. So thank you guys so much for sending in questions. Uh, this podcast is based off your questions. You can listen to us on Apple or Spotify. You can watch us on YouTube and you can leave a review at any of those places. We love reviews. We love your feedback and we love your questions even more. So you can go to at questions with Crocker on social media, uh, leave us your thoughts and we look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks and have a great day.